I'm very happy to be here and to meet you. And thank you, Abby, for inviting me. Uh, it's been an amazing journey being your co-supervisor and uh, well, this thing, your university, your research group is an amazing experience for me. So my apologies in advance. My English is not in the best shape. So I'm trying to do my best. If you don't understand, just let me know. I'm going to talk about, well, water, urban resilience, water sensitive design, how to build sustainable city. That's the topic I'm working on. And uh, I'm going to present part of the work we have been carrying out in the last, let's say, five to six years. Um, so I'm based in Bogota. I'm from Bogota, from the capital city of Colombia. Uh, I'm not sure if you have been there or not. If not, most welcome to visit us. And now this semester, I'm doing a sabbatical leave in Georgia State University, working in the same kind of issues, but in a different context. So I will talk about briefly about the urban challenges, which is that cat. very common to us. Any city in any part of the world are facing similar challenges in a different ways. Uh, I will talk about particularly about how urban water management can, uh, can, can improve or not the situation of urban sustainability. And uh, more particularly, I will be, speak about how to handle and manage stormwater, which is one part of the uh, water fluxes in, in, in cities. Uh, I will talk about a new paradigm to handle with those issues and part of our contribution, some example of them and some conclusions. So first of all, let's start with the urban challenges. So a uh, formal definition of urban challenges are all those factors that somehow limit the capacity of cities to resist or to adapt to chronic or acute stressors to protect or preserve the environment to minimize environmental impacts, but also minimizing the potential of enhanced social ecological aspects in, in urban areas. Uh, and at the end, well, local economic is also um, stressed if we don't cope with those stressors. So there is many type of urban challenges. For example, material and solid waste, water management, climate change issues, green and circular economy, physical and well-being of the population, and also how to uh, provide enough infrastructure for in the built environment without much impact. So I'm a civil engineer by training, also an environmental engineer. So I always think in water, not only in quantities, but also in, qu in quality for my uh, background. And if you think of the type of infrastructure we need uh, in terms of water services in cities, there is many type of water services we need. And there is many objectives we have to achieve and also several functions we have to provide. Uh, so first of all, the, the starting point in the water services is to provide water supply in a secure manner. Uh, so engineers are able to provide water supply systems. Uh, and then another problem uh, appears, which is public health protection. We can use and consume water, but you, we change the quality and then we release that again to the environment with a very different water quality characteristics impacting uh, the public health. So now we have to handle with, let's say, uh, wastewater and other contaminated water flows. But then rain occurs in an urban area and now we have to handle with floods. So we have the water supply city, then the sewer city, and now the drain city. But we also have to think about the impact in the water resources, let's say lakes, wetlands, rivers, and so on. So we have to protect that environmental assets uh, in the, near to the urban areas. Then we have to think about that the water is a resource, but it's a limited resource. So we have to do a better management of the demand and the way we supply water to the population. So um, not only use potable water for all uses. For example, if I want to flush a toilet, we normally use potable water, water that you and my kids can drink without any problem in most of the cases where are these big cities. But that's not anymore sustainable. We have to think of the why we are needing that quality and use the, the to fit the quality to the purpose we, we, we intend to do for that water. And last but not least, 
is the like the final aim of any city nowadays, which is becoming a water sensitive city. So let's remember we have this water supply city, sewer city, drain city, water wise city, water cycle city, in which we reuse, let's say, gray water, we use rain, water harvest, harvesting to uh, consume some part of the water. And then we have to think now about multifunctional infrastructure. If we think in the conventional way to handle and manage water, that infrastructure only provides one objective and one function. For example, if we need water, the water supply system only supplies water. If we build, uh, let's say, a um, pluvial drainage system, that system only provides the function of draining away of the city, the stormwater. But nowadays, we have to provide multifunctional infrastructure that, at the same time, they provide several different uh, like potential benefits. So that's what we call water sensitive city. From my background, from my city, from my country, most of our cities are in the, at least in the best scenario, in the first three ones. Somehow we have water supply. Somehow we are collecting wastewater. Not in many cases we have treatment of that water. And still some urban areas are facing a lot of problems with rainfall cures. But nowadays, even developed and developing countries and contexts has to work towards that water sensitive uh, well, stage. So this is an illustration of how, how the urbanization process impacts the urban environment. There is, well, fluxes, uh, hydrological fluxes, fluxes that are affected very much, for example, how evapotranspiration, infiltration, runoff, uh, are impacted by the urbanization. So here's some summary. After the urbanization process in any urban area, there is an increased magnitude uh, of volumes of, uh, of stormwater. So that's why we have more flood events, more, which more frequency. Uh, there is a reduced capacity in the urban areas to infiltrate water that occurs naturally. But if we change the land use, water cannot infiltrate anymore that easily. We reduce evapotranspiration. The vegetation cover plays a very important role in evapotranspirated water that is in the soil and the surface. So that is reduced also. We reduce the fluxes going through the subsurface. So we reduce aquifer recharge. We reduce the base flow, which is the actual flow that we see in the rivers and the creeks is reduced. Thank you. Uh, we increase the run of velocity. If we have a developed uh, urban area, the, the time that a, a drop of rain needs to get out of the urban area is shorter if in comparison to the an, an actual landscape or area. Uh, that's the concentration time. We have an increased flood risk, of course, but last but not least, there is a decrease in the water quality. It's not only floods, it's about the quality of that water which is a problem, can be, but also can be a potential water to be reused in other purposes. When we think about floods, rainfall, we normally tend to think more clearly about those extreme events, those that generate those floods or their, that of course impacted uh, our lives in the, in the cities, but it's not only those extreme events that are these ones with the sea letter. These two are also very important. For example, this one, the design events. We, when we design from the engineering perspective, any drainage system, we are assuming a risk. We cannot, or well, normally we do not design our systems to cope with the most extreme event. It's not cost efficient at some point. So we, 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 when we design how, which event, rain event is the one we use for designs, we are assuming a certain risk. But these ones, and when, and uh, uh, from the design perspective, we are now uh, asking ourselves which one now has to be the rainfall event for our designs. In, in urban drainage, it, it depends on the impact and the importance of the area, but it, it, it ranges from, let's say, three to five years till maximum 50 years of return period. But now we are experiencing more extreme events more frequently. So, Perhaps we have to change the way we design our drainage systems, but also these events that they are called everyday rain events are those ones that we, we can capture and use for 
later purposes. But if we want to do rainwater harvesting, those events that are of our interest are these ones, not the extreme ones. So some short videos from, from my home city in, in Bogota, I'm gonna show. So, well, this is a highly urbanized area near the, the city center. And you see a manhole that is surcharged. And uh, when you ask people, what's, what's the problem behind this? Most of the people think it's climate change. Yes, rainfall patterns are changing and can be. But there is many other issues here. They can be, for example, when we designed this sewer system, no one was able to understand how the catchment was evolved in the future and the urbanization process just changed completely the, the land uses. And now, of course, we have much more volume to handle. Or we don't see how the sewer system is because the sewer system is underground. We don't see how is in which status it is. So perhaps it's a problem of operation and maintenance. So not all flood events are related to climate change. And there is actually, in some cases, in which climate change plays a little role. It's much more important the way we change the land use mm. or problems in operations and maintenance, not climate change. Of course, there is other contexts, other type of events in which climate change is, uh, is key to understand what's happening. Another short video, again, from Bogota. Bogota has, is, is, is kind of a flat city, but there is some parts close to the mountains. And if you see the, the, the color of the water is completely different. So runoff is not only carrying out water, we, it carries pollution, solid sediments, and many other stuff. And well, certainly it affects the daily, uh, daily, the day, the, the day of the population. We have to handle with these very small frequency and have to think uh, how to do it with conventional system or with other issues or other features. So what's the new paradigm? So I'm going to start with a definition of, of nature-based solutions. So nature-based solutions are, well, we have problems and we need solutions. One way to solve the, those problems is with uh, infrastructure that mimics or yes, or replicate the nature environment. So our solutions that are inspired and supported some, sometimes and many times by nature, we, we hope that they are cost effective and that, that this, this is very difficult to at least assess, to be very sure that they are cost effective, but we think they are, and simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits. You remember the multifunctionality that we need now in our infrastructure. So this is becoming more important uh, each day. And at the end of the day, we want to help to build resilience in urban areas. This is the European Commission definition. So we have three types of nature-based solutions. First of all is, of course, the conservation of the ecosystems that are already in place well, in the urban area on the area we want to urbanize. Second option is to restore, to restore pre-existing vegetation. And the last but not least is to create new infrastructure, new ecosystems. We call that sustainable urban drainage systems, green infrastructure, and Dr. Abi is now an expert on that. <laughs> uh, so perhaps in, in, in your dissertation, Abi was someone was asking what we have to do. We, 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 we can or we want to start a new city from the scratch. Of course, this is the first stage. We have to conserve as much as we can what we have in place already. But as the organization goes, we have to restore the pre-existing conditions. But if that's not enough. Well, for core, of course, we can implement new infrastructure. So, well, we have several urban challenges, and we hope that with these nature-based solutions, we can achieve many, uh, well, it's a way to handle with many of the urban issues. We call that ecosystem services. So urban, urban green, blue, and these sustainable urban drainage systems are systems that are not only able to handle with water. They provide water regulation, but at the same time, they provide many other benefits to the urban environment. That's the multifunctionality. Particularly, there is one type of nature-based solutions that are designed and conceived, particularly to handle the storm water. They are, they are called sustainable urban drainage system. And recognizing that they provide multi -benef multi multiple benefits, they improve the water quality, and they regulate the quantity, they provide urban biodiversity, and they provide attractive spaces 
that's particularly important in urban areas in which there is not much urban spaces, not much trees, not much park, um, which is not the case in any in all cities. So some example of what sustainable urban drainage systems looks like. So for example, bioretention zones, tree boxes or tree pits, uh, green swales, infiltration trenches, porous pavements, green roofs, these ones are from my university in Bogota, harvesting tanks, dry detention basin. This one is our pilot, our full-scale laboratory in, in, in my city. Uh, and for example, this one, we are very familiar to trees in urban areas. But the point is water that uh, rainfall that uh, falls in this in this street is not able to get into the tree. I mean, because we the way we design the, the, the street, the way we design the sidewalks is very different if we allow if we allow the water, the storm water to get into the tree. If we don't, it's a small change, but it's a big change in water management. So Coming from Avi's work, there is many barriers. I mean, there is a lot, lot of potentialities of implementing sustainable urban drainage systems, but at the same time, there is a lot of barriers, not only in developing countries, but in developed ones. I'm going to talk about particularly how to tackle with the technical ones. In, in our context, providing uh, like guidance to the municipalities, to the cities, where to implement sustainable urban drainage systems, what type, for what purposes is rather important because well we need that those objective tools to do that so this is if you want to learn more about the, this new paradigm this is a review paper we, we wrote with some of my phd students on how to use modeling tools to provide this support to, to to the cities to better understand what are the needs how to build these systems in a city so now I'm going to speak what we have been doing in the last years in my city, particularly, to contribute towards this objective, to have greener cities, a better uh, management of water. So I will speak at different uh, uh, spatial scales. So first, I will start with the city scale, the full city scale. Bogota is an uh, nearly 8 million inhabitants, let's say 7.5 million inhabitants, a very large city in terms of population, but in size is not that big. So it's very dense. So it's a particular, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenging uh, case. Doesn't matter if you have been or not, or if you are familiar with the shape of the city. This is the north, this is the south. Here are the mountains. Here is the Bogota River in this part. So we divided the city in subcatchings and we colored the, the areas to try to well, to identify where are the problems in my city. So we came up with indexes to assess and quantify how the water quantity, if water quantity is a problem, for example, if any in this in this uh, image, in this figure is uh, an area is in red, it means that that area is, is in higher risk of floods, for example, if the area in comparison to the area that is in green. So this is water quantity, this is water quality. So for example, these red areas are areas that are directly connected to the river and that part of the river is, high, is heavily polluted. So in this part of the city, we are in, in, in bigger need of in, in treating the storm water, let's say. And for example, here are other type of indexes, for example, social indexes. So because I said, Sustainable urban drainage system can, can cope with different uh, urban challenges, for example, improve the air quality. So having information about where are the areas of the city which more problems with, let's say, uh, particulate matter, which affects the well, the, the kids and the elder people population. Or well, for example, if there other there is Bogota is a very is, is an area or an urban area in which there is large inequities. So, for example, the wealth part of the city is much more uh, equipped with parks and urban areas, not in the less uh, affluent part of the of, of the society. So, for example, this red part means that in terms of social aspects, for example, impact to the population in terms of uh, 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 public health or lack of urban areas or lack of parks or so on, these are the zones in which need the most these implementations. So here you can see, 
we take into account, we took into account the number of trees per area, uh, how many of people population under five or over 60 years lives, uh, the low economic, socioeconomic levels, distance to parks, and so on. Uh, but also, we have here what we call uh, green corridor index, blue green corridor index. We, we, we have to implement sustainable urban drainage system taking into account we, what we have in the city already. Where are the creeks, where are the parks, where are the, those corridors that we have to connect to, to integrate uh, the urban area into the existing ecosystems. Uh, well, and for example, this, this classification shows areas in, of the city in which uh, there's ongoing plans to implement new infrastructure, for example, a new road or uh, an intervention of renewal of a certain area. So those projects are key to implement this type of infrastructure. So at the end of this analysis, it's not only when what, by, what, what, what areas of the city are in need of this or are suffering these issues, but also re regarding the physical restriction of the city where it's possible to implement sustainable urban drainage system because we need a certain type of soils, we need a certain type of slopes. We have we need a certain a space available and so on. So based on a spatial analysis, this is the entire city. We came up with different type of sustainable urban drainage systems and the potential areas in which they can be implemented. So we can match where they need when we need this implementation and when or and where can be implemented because of their physical restrictions. And you see, for example, that not all the typologies or type of SATs can be implemented in an equal manner. It depends on the characteristic of the physical uh, of, of the urban areas. So additional reading for this, some, some papers that have looked at the entire city scale. So now my city has like this planning tool. In, in any part of the city, we know if it's needed or not, they will the the a better handling of store water and what type of solution can be applied to that area. Now going to a more a smaller scale, which is the urban development scale. So we, we recently had a project funded by the UK government and we work closely with the Colombian um, Green uh, Council. Uh, and our work was, was just part of that project. I mean of course Water management is just one bit of the issues we have to handle when we think of, uh, let's say, sustainable cities. We, if we think about sustainable cities, we have to build in energy. We have to think about how to do better transportation systems, urban ecology, waste, how to handle with, day, with waste, building systems. And we, we play a role here in this part, integrated water management. So of course, thinking mm -hmm. in sustainability is not only a better handling of water, but there is many interaction of water with other of these aspects. For example, there is a strong connection between integrated water management with transport and transportation system, for, for, because streets are those areas in a city in which larger volumes of stored water are produced. Yeah, but if we reduce the space for cars, for pedestrians, for bikes, we are reducing the capacity to, to transport people or transport goods, for example. But we need space also in streets. So we have to work closely with transport systems. And uh, well, of course, with waste, if we don't have a proper waste management, the water management systems also impacts and suffers a lot. And in terms of energy, it's also very important because if we treat water, we consume a lot of energy to produce um, well, potable water to treat wastewater, we consume a lot of energy, but at the same time, our treatment systems can be able to recover and to provide energy supply to other issues, to other for other purposes. So there is interconnections. So we analyze, uh, let's see, it's not the, the city scale, there's like urban development scale. We analyze two cases studies in, in, my, in my city. I'm gonna present uh, some results briefly. So, what we propose here is normally, when you think in the last decades, which of these components were more the more prominent and the more important when designing a city? Perhaps transportation buildings were those that we certainly think in the first place. And then the, the, the rest is just, we have to supply water, we have to supply energy, 
But nowadays, we have to think that the most important uh, assets of any urban area are these ones. The urban ecology that is present in the urban area and also very linked to the urban ecology, the inter water, integrated water management. So it's a, it's a different way of changing the, the way we think our cities. So now the objective of any urban area is, first of all, to provide good land use. As I said, when we urbanize areas, we impact a lot the, the, the land use, and that generates a lot of problems. So first of all, we have to think better ways to uh, better uh, land use. Uh, in, our, in, in our areas. We degraded a lot of our ecosystem services. Now we have to maximize those ecosystem services in urban areas. Uh, of course, we have we, we will produce uh, like, um, uh, we have to produce uh, infrastructure that is able to better manage the resources that we have available, water, energy, waste, and so on. We want to enhance the well-being of the population, and we have we want to have innovative cities that are well communicated and the economy in good shape. But see that the well the, the priorities are changing the way we build our cities. Uh, so we came up. Do you remember this? This part, I started the presentation with this: the different phases of the urban water management, water supply city, sewer city, drain city, waterway city, water cycle city, and water sensitive city. So we. Uh, proposed indexes that say we can assess an urban area in all these stages and at different scale at the watershed, in the water supply system, in the wastewater system, and just only looking at the stormwater management. So we can quantify the, perform the performance of any urban area. So we, we uh, let's say, uh, are use different indexes to, for example, to assess the water supply city. Uh, different indexes to assess how the sewer city is, is working or not in the city, the drain city, different indexes to quantify where are the problems, where are the, where are the opportunities to improve the water management in a city. So imagine we did that not only for water, for, but for the rest of the different uh, aspects, solid waste, uh, solid, uh, energy, building transportation, and so on. So at the end, we came up with let's say more than a hundred indexes, very complex, but at the same very useful to identify where are the problems of sustainability in urban areas. So I'm gonna pass this, not that important. And this is the assessment for one of those cases in, in my city. So you see here, the bigger the percentage, the better the performance. So there is some aspects that we, ass we assessed a new area that won an expansion area in the city that was designed in the under the concept of sustainable cities. So it uh, somehow we assume that is the best possible scenario that we have now in place. But even though that was kind of well designed from the beginning, we, we see certain aspects that they are performing well, but certainly there's a lot of opportunities for improvements. Continue with the urban development scale. This is an ongoing project. It's called EUPOLIS. It's, uh, it's funded by the European Commission. We are part of that project. Uh, look, the final aim is to introduce nature-based solutions, not only for water management, but at the end, what we want is to enhance the health and the well-being of the citizens, the final aim. If we are able to cope with those urban challenges, what we are doing is improving the health and the well-being of the citizens. So in this project, what we are doing is to implement a, method a methodology to select and locate nature-based solutions. Remember that in previous projects, we have been working in how to select and locate sustainable urban drainage systems. Now we are looking in a more broader pers perspective, nature-based solutions to handle with urban challenges. Uh, to ass by, by assessing ecosystem services, having in mind that we are impacting different aspects in, in, in the area, uh, we want to do some socioeconomic assessment of those benefits. We are working particularly now in that part is rather challenging, but very, very needed. And at the end of the day, we, have, we want to produce tools that are able to provide guidelines in the decision-making process. So I'm going to talk mainly about the first one and first two, because we are now in phase three, which is the evaluation of the benefits. But if we want to implement nature-based solutions, first we start with the baseline analysis. And we have to define what are the most important urban challenges according to the 
needs and the characteristics of any site, what are the most important indicators that we have to address, what are the problems. We propose a set of nature-based solutions according to, to the site requirements. We carried out an effectiveness analysis because there is many, many different types of nature-based solutions, but not all, all of them are equally able to provide the same outputs or, the, or to improve the, the situation in the same quantity. So we have to analyze the effective, effectiveness of the proposed nature-based solutions at the end to select the most efficient ones. But we are doing this with the stakeholder perception. We are doing this with urban planners' participation, of course, literature to review expert criteria and so on, but citizens' participation is key here. It's not a top-down approach, it's a bottom-up uh, one. To better understand what are the needs and what are the perception of the community about the issues and the potential solutions. One, we define what are the the, what, how the baseline looks like, we have now to locate those nature-based solutions. So we, again, rely on the citizen, citizen's perception. We evaluate different ecosystem services. We map the priority areas in the urban area. We did a feasibility analysis, and then we came up with the potential location of different nature-based solutions. And then the last the phase three analysis is we have to value those ecosystem services to us to come up with a cost-benefit analysis, but we are in that part of the of the project now. So some examples we have, this is a different part of the city. Here is Bogota. This area here is our case study in this case. It's an area that is, is a, in a renewal process. In the future, it will be a train station here, a massive uh, transportation uh, system station here. And, but it's a very, it's an area which a lot of social, economical, and environmental problems. So we have to decide and provide guidance what type of nature-based solutions are needed here. You see here, it's a very dense city, not much urban areas. So this is certainly an opportunity to change the way we plan our city, taking into account the issues for that particular area. So what the tools does is, for example, in the base analysis, we analyze now not only sustainable urban drainage system, but different type of nature-based solutions, such as multifunctional pocket parks, urban forest, green corridors, and we assess different ecosystem services to see which one is the most effective for, for, the, for the area. With the population perception, we identify those priority areas to uh, be intervene, and then for different ecosystem services, we identify the priorities, where are the highest priorities for different ecosystem services, and at the end, we identify what type of nature-based solution. Sorry, it's too small, but here, bioretention zones, green corridor, pocket parks, sustainable urban drain system, three boxes, urban forest. So we can we have now a tool that can, can provide guidance in, in an in a urban area to say what type of nature-based solutions according to the um, particular issues. So if, one, if you want to learn more about this project, this is the web page. You can access this with the QR. Uh, Code. So, some more articles related to that particular project. And then we came up with a very more fine scale, the macro scale, because we started with the city scale, the urban development one, and now tools to decide, for example, in that particular part, what type of uh, implementation is needed. So, what we have done is like a very simple tool. It worked in, in Excel, it's very simple. But now it's part of the regulation of the system, of the city. So Bogota is the only city in Colombia that have um, a regulation, a norm that uh, guides the design of these systems. And part of that guideline, there is, is this, this tool. So we start to identify what type of sustainable urban system is feasible for a certain part of the city. Well, there is different type of selection criteria. Uh, we well, the, the decision maker decide what what are the criteria to, to select them, what type of processes, as Avi explained yesterday in, in her dissertation, sustainable urban drainage systems are different processes. We can store and uh, water, we can transport water, we can infiltrate water, and depends on, on this, in the area we are designing, we want to implement infiltration only, or we want to implement infiltration and storage, or transport also at the same time. So we have to define what processes are needed, and then the tool, provide a train of, of systems. It's not only one typology, it's, it's a combination of them because each one is very different. Different purposes, different processes. So need a, we need a train rather than one solution. 
So this is the well the, the, the guideline in Colombia. We did that for that project. Is so in the guideline we say how to design from the hydrological and hydraulic perspective three boxes, green, gray swales, permeable pavements, infiltration trenches, and different type of sets. And then this is some uh, photos from the our pilot scale uh, implementation. This is an urban park, urban park in, in, in Bogota. So based on the analysis I have presented, we selected this particular type of suit, which is a, a, a swale first and the infiltration trench. Um, I'm going to show a video here. So that's a, this was a rain event in 2017. So some this is the entrance, the inlet to the such train train in which you, we capture the water quality, the water quantity. That's for our research. So this is the swale. So this water that is flowing into the park uh, in, in a in conventional situation is that those flows goes into the sewer system underground and then is released directly to the river. But now we capture this water in, in the surface. We put it in a park. Is being treated because the water quality is being improved by natural and physical processes. It's being transported, it's being infiltrated. So this, this is a swale. Then um, the second part of this treatment train is, is a infiltration um, a scene or catchment like this one. Uh, is designed to be filled with a, let's say, control uh, water depth in order to avoid security problems. And here, this is a very simple hydraulic. A control structure that regulates the water that is going out of the system. So we store the water, the water is infiltrated, the water is treated. So the amount of water that is released into the environment, into the environment released into the river is much less with a better quality. So here we see the amount of water that is getting out is less. So we store the water and providing storage capacity, we are treating the water. So we have been Doing some monitoring inside, monitoring analysis of this treatment train to understand the performance of the system, how they change over the time. So we have been working with different IoT uh, technologies to monitor, uh, uh, let's say, less costly the infrastructure. We have also because this is not black or gray or black or white; it's grays in between. Sustainable or gray drain systems provide provide a lot of benefits, but at the same time. They can um, have several problems. For example, if you see in these pictures, now people that visit the park are more exposed to these water volumes and their pathogens in here. So if we don't provide guidance and we don't assess the, the risk of the population, we, we are we, we, we can provide we, we, we can create additional problems. So we have been working with my colleagues there. Uh, with other colleagues on the well assessing the risk of pathogens in that type of infrastructure. So I'm uh, arriving to the end of my presentation, some conclusions. So certainly sustainable urban drainage systems can help us to tackle with different urban challenges. I stress that is not what we need now is multifunctional infrastructure, providing different benefits to the urban areas. Despite the recent advances, such as Avi's PhD thesis, we certainly have many barriers to overcome. So we need more research, not only developed contexts, but in developing ones. Uh, a more holistic, sustainable urban planning is urgently needed. So it's not only water management, it's urban planning. Water management is part of the urban plan. And we have to integrate better our solutions into that framework. And decision support tools are key to promote to promote the stakeholders' informed decisions. If we want to involve people, different stakeholders, population, and so on, having decision support tools is very powerful to uh, allow everyone to put the, the opinion and the perceptions there. Uh, so I'm very happy because when I finished my PhD, well, I did my PhD in the UK. And uh, I learned when I was doing my PhD that these type of solutions were already in place in, in Europe and in the other context. So when I arrived to, to my home country, I started lecturing, doing some research, and I was saying, always say, OK, let's see in how many years we will have this type of implementations in place. But now we have norms, guidance. We have design guidelines. The, the city itself, the institution itself, are promoting the use of sustainable urban drainage system in very different contexts. You see here. A part of Bogota. You see the, the, the social 
uh, characteristics are very particular, very dense areas, not much green spaces, like low income se settings. But in new infrastructure developments, they are implementing here, for example, value retention filters. So that's a big, big change in the way we are planning my city. And this is in the north of the city, the more wealthiest part of the city, but they are also implementing nature-based solutions there. So Bogota is adopting very fastly this, this approach. I'm very happy with that. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope that was somehow clear and you have learned at least something new. And uh, well, it's my pleasure to have to have your attention. <laughs>